Thank you. Yes, I can hear myself. Hello, everybody. I, uh, as Simon was so kind to say, I'm David Trana Christiansen. I'm the executive director of the Haskell Foundation only since May, so it's, it's still a somewhat new gig for me. Um, I'd like to thank Nadia and the rest of the organizing committee for inviting me to give this talk here today. <clears throat> and I'd like to tell you a story of a dream. And that dream is completely unrealistic, which is lazy, pure functional programming. In the early days, people look at this and they think, how could this ever work, right? I mean, like, yes, we can like write an evaluator and make things go, but but it you know we, we clearly we can't make useful big systems in it, right? Wrong. It actually works. It's really cool. So um, how has this happened? Well, um, you know, implementations, especially things like GHC. You know, we 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 did a, we went off as a community. You know, this is certainly back when I was in diapers and started doing research. You know, hack hack hack, but also build things and do it rigorously, and that. That gave a real useful system, which feeds into honest-to-goodness users who are doing things like running companies and making money. And, and these users, they, well, they start encountering limitations that perhaps were unanticipated. And this feeds back and gives research problems. And the system gets better. And the users' lives get better. And then they become more ambitious. And they start doing more and more useful things. And, and we have this real virtuous cycle, which has kind of been a lot of the history of something like Haskell, which... I think would have surprised people back when I was in diapers in the 80s. So today I'm going to talk a little bit about our roots, um, where I think we should go, some dreams about how we might get there, um, a little bit about impact, and then finally about my gracious employer, the Haskell Foundation. So as a community, um, where does Haskell come out of? Well, in the 1980s, there's this real sort of period of intellectual excitement about laziness. We get things like Miranda and Gopher and LazyML, you know, Dan Friedman writes, cons should not evaluate its arguments. And, and it's all this sort of very interesting period of thinking like, what, is this, what does this idea of laziness mean? You know, in the 90s, we get some consolidation. Many of these languages kind of get together and say, we're going to make Haskell. And people begin implementing it, it begins working, um, you know, and, and, and we end up sort of culminating with 1998's Haskell 98. Um, in the in the in the zero zeros in what do you call this in the nulls? <laughs> um, uh, I, I heard some suggestions. What what do we call it? The decade. The oddies. I like this. I'll call it the noddies just for fun. Um, back in the noddies, we start getting uh, you know, we start getting faster implementations, better code generators. You know, they they start getting sort of battle hardened, and we get all this wonderful support for concurrency built on the foundation of laziness and purity, and and all is good. Um, you know, the, and these are sort of broad decades, right? Like, you know, every decade bleeds a bit into the one before it and the one after it. But in the 2010s, there's the, we start getting a real focus on sort of extending the frontier of what we can add expressive types to. You know, we, like, yeah, we had gadgets in the OOs, in, in the noddies, but, you know, we start getting all the fancy stuff in the 2010s. But, you know, it seems to me that that is starting to get to, to, to where it's going to get, you know. Like, probably we're going to get some more fancy things, but I suspect that that's going to slow down a little. And what should we do in these roaring 20s? Um, my suggestion, my proposal for us as a community is that we start looking at innovation in interactive developer tooling. And <clears throat> so the way, here's how I think about it. In the old days, um, a compiler looked like this. It was a function from source code to object code. You, know, you you throw source code into the front, and you get object code out the back. And this is a truth with modification, right? Like, actually, it was a function from source code to the disjoint union of object code and somebody telling you why you're wrong. Um, you know, and, but the, the invocation of a compiler was really something along these lines. But today, that, that's not how the world works, right? All of our, all of our expectations have changed. Today, we, we, in one single run of the system, with as low latency as possible, we submit our source code, and it gives us some feedback. It says, you know, this bit, that's pretty good. This other bit over here is a bit questionable. This bit is flat out nonsense. This part's OK, and so on. And, and a human sort of interactively looks at that and says, well, OK, I, I've learned something by that feedback. And they sort of push forth a change, which the process then looks at and says, oh, yeah, well, you know, a few of those things got worked out. Um, there's still some questionable things. You didn't do all of it. And then the user thinks, yeah, you're right. You know? So they, they consider the feedback. They make a new version. 
sometimes they're making the new version with the help of that running process, you know, saying things like, uh, uh, you know, move this code around for me, rename this thing for me, fix my imports, whatever it is. And, you know, they get some more in information and eventually they get satisfied. You know, you don't have to be a warning completionist. I, I don't believe in W error, but... Uh, and there's some empirical support for this, actually. There was this uh, paper in Uppsala 21 called How Statically Typed Pro Functional Programmers Write Code. And it, uh, they, they empirically studied how functional, statically typed functional programmers write code. And they found out that, indeed, there is an iterative feedback loop between the writing down of the types and the writing down of the programs, um, that people really don't like representing things redundantly. Um, that, uh, that, that people use type errors essentially as to-do lists. In other words, as, as probably everyone in this room knows, a type error doesn't mean you're wrong. A type error simply means you've got more to do. Um, but but that, that's not always something that's the case for people in every community. Um, the, the type errors indeed are expected and welcome because we want to create them because it helps us out. That people often engage in sort of sketching out a program. You know, they'll write down some type signatures, They'll write down a, they'll leave some holes behind and get the computer's help to fill them out. Um, and indeed, many edits made to a program are actually not done because that's how they want the program definitely to be, but rather to signal an intent to a future version of themselves who's entered a new mental state or has done other things and can then return and, and get something done. And you know, oftentimes, you know, a type error is a way to signal a future change, but oftentimes, you know, we, we do other things as well, holes, whatever. And also, uh, an interesting thing that might be controversial to people in this room is that definitions by pattern matching were significantly easier to write than ones with combinators and less mentally taxing. Um, and then finally, they found that there isn't really a sort of one true way of thinking about the domain being modeled. That, that programmers, the same programmer doing different tasks will use different ways of thinking and also different programs on the same task. And that's probably well and good. And that also matches with my sort of guess. But you know, this, this is a great paper. You should go read it. Um, and the, the, the thing that we have today, which makes all of our lives so much better, is the Haskell language server. For those in the room who are still living in the 1970s world of batch mode compilers, the way, like Simon here, Simon asked me to add this picture to the, to the slides, actually. <laughs> um, you know, you have, your, you have your, your, your editor on the left, which I put in a nice sort of hacker green color, and it, it's um, giving you feedback about your program. And it's communicating with a process on the back end, HLS, by sending you know, JSON RPC messages back and forth. Um, HLS is built on top of the GHC API, but it's not sort of shelling out to GHC as a separate process. Um, and you know, the, the things that we can do with LSP are perhaps somewhat limited by the fact that the, the language server protocol was really designed for languages like TypeScript and C Sharp. So it doesn't necessarily have the verbs we want to have if we were designing something for Haskell from the start. But nonetheless, it is really great. Um, and it has a plugin architecture. So if you want to do research on interesting interactions with the machine, you don't have to do all the heavy lifting. There's a, there's a system where you can build a little piece and go work further on that. Um, and well, why, why might we care about this, right? Like, you know, I'm coming up here and saying, researchers, please make tools. Why? But you know, like, what's in it for you? Um, well, what's in it for you is, I think, impact. And what is impact? Well, having impact on the world, that's really adopted ideas, right? Like if you have an idea that everyone ignores, that's not impact. If people, if you get people to do the thing that they're already doing, then you're also not having impact. You really kind of need both of those ingredients. And as Simon also nicely phrased it for me the other day, um, papers are really a vector for ideas, but implementations are a vector for demand for ideas. So in other words, you come up with something with a great idea, but if you want it to escape from a, a small circle of Haskell Symposium attendees, then one way to do that is to have an implementation that is joyful to use, that makes people very, very happy. Um, and then it may even escape from Haskell. Um, so then we come to, to the question that I think is probably on all of your minds. And um, that is, how do we, as a community, build these tools that work in practice? Actually, no, that's not what's on your mind. What's on your mind is how do we build and publish about tools that work in practice? Because you know, you're not here to like hack, hack, hack. You're here, I mean, most of you are here actually also because you, know, you need to make things that are sort of well-grounded and innovative and that make sense and that you need to explain that to other people. And that's a very, very key thing. So 
here's what I see personally as as some challenges to publishing in this area. One is that, uh, and, and the big one is like, how do we evaluate the work, right? Like what, what consists of good work in this area? And more importantly, how do we convince the program committee that we've done good work in this area? And how should the program committee ask you to convince them that you've done good work in the area? Well, one issue is user studies. Um, they're very expensive if you want to get expert users. Um, and, and tools that work for expert users are very, very important. You know, things, things that, make the, that make really skilled, experienced programmers do better have a really powerful multiplicative effect on the kinds of productivity we can have. But you can't just go out and hire, you know, 30 um, expert Haskellers to spend, you know, maybe six months using your tool and get good at it and then study how well it helps them. Like, nobody has that kind of budget. Um, on the other hand, you know, the, the people who many of us have access to, like undergrads who've used it for an hour, um, they're a very important demographic. You know, inexperienced programmers should also have access to good tools, but they're sort of, they're not going to be inexperienced for very long. Like, a big point of education is to help them be less inexperienced. So, um, to the extent that you're succeeding in educating your students, they're going to quickly, quickly get out of this group, and <clears throat> then the results you make based on them become less and less relevant for them. And we've also got this real problem, <clears throat> excuse me, which is that as a community, we're not that good. Like we just don't have the skills and background about how to do user studies well. You know, so maybe you personally do, and then your PC is going to say, "Is this good? I don't know." Or, or maybe you don't know how to do it, and, you're, and, and even worse, the program committee might say, "I don't know if this is good." And then, so so we we need to find a way to sort of bootstrap that knowledge in our community if we want to work on these things. So so what can we measure without putting it in front of people? Well, we can, we can do things like, you know, prove a soundness theorem. Like, my, my refactoring will never introduce new type errors to my program. Or, um, but is that necessarily the most relevant aspect to measure? Um, right? Like, the, the things we can prove theorems about and the things that we can make the graph which says, you know, performance goes up, like, those are valuable. But they're not the only thing that's relevant. So, you know, you want to, when, and when you're making something, you don't just want to like evaluate some aspect of it because that's what we could measure. You know, we want to measure the thing that is most relevant. <clears throat> um, other, other sort of incentive issues. One is that at many universities, the maintenance of tooling is not going to give you tenure. Um, you know, especially sort of bibliometrics uh, obsessed European universities. Also, um, Haskell tools require a fair bit of maintenance. Like Haskell code does bit rot faster than, say, um, standard ML code. <laughs> And this means that you end up spending a bit more time on maintenance, and that time is going away from other things that you could do that allow you to make progress in the way you pay your bills. So let's let's think creatively together, right? Like that, like what I, what I think is not reasons not to do it. It's more things that we should figure out how to overcome. So I've got some dreams for you today. These are these are like, you know, if I'm if I'm waking up in the morning with a smile on my face. These are the things that I've dreamed about in the next five years at the Haskell Symposium. Um, and I've, I've sort of got a common format for them. I'm going to come out with the, the thing that I'd like to see and then um, some examples of, you know, what I don't, you know, I, I, none of you are going to write, a, use this as a spec for a paper. I really hope you don't because you're all smarter than I am. But, you know, maybe some examples to, to make you see how, how I'm thinking about it. And then also some ideas about how we might evaluate these things in a publication. So my, my first dream here is how do we best provide context-aware editing actions for Haskell? So let's, let's write some Scala code. Um, Scala has this wonderful syntactic feature, which is a dot. You know, so I sit there in my, in my editor, I type val input equals standard in dot, and then a little menu appears. And that menu tells me all the things I can do with standard in. That's super cool. Uh, you know, but you know, the Haskell is, does not have that kind of a syntax. So what could we do? Well, one thing we might think of is if we have a program with a type error. So in this context, there's a, you know, a little REPL. You know, we, we put out a prompt. We get a line of input. We parse the input. We evaluate the result of the parsing. And then we try to print out the result. And, and we get a type error, right? So like moving my mouse over my type error here, I get a little pop-up. And it says, well, I expected a string, but I got a val. OK, that makes sense. So uh, you know, I, I hit the auto complete or the, the, do the, the do the useful thing key binding, and it surrounds it with a hole, right? And, and because these, these kinds of nice interactive editing actions build on top of one another, I can now move my, my mouse over the hole. 
And uh, using Matthias' stuff, I can get a little pop-up and, and say, like, what fits in the hole? Uh, so we've already, got, you know, we've already got a lot of these things, but if we get more of them, then they'll have this nice sort of synergistic effect. Like, you know, the more, like adding new primitives to our language means we can write more programs. Adding more primitives to our editor means that we can edit programs in more interesting combined ways. Um, another thing that actually is, it, we could, we're pretty close to today, is uh, when I'm sketching out a program, I might know I need a function, you know, and then I can uh, right click on it and get my menu. And HLS will already do this at the top level of the file. It would be cool if we could also sort of find some nice paradigm for thinking about what scope the helper belongs in. Oh. So how do we think about things like editor actions? Well, one of them is that we might have some soundness results, like you know, the editor action never makes the program worse. Um, we might have some sort of notion of uh, complete editing suite, so we could get, you know, like given any two programs, we can always get from one to the other using these edits. I don't actually know if that's a good measure, but it's an interesting one. Um, and we might also come up with like a benchmark suite of editing tasks and then measure how much more efficient the, the new verbs in our language make it. You know, and, so, and, and maybe sort of get the Livenstein distance between two programs and then by enriching the language of action, see how short we can get it for some realistic tasks. Um, a couple of things to look at if you're interested in this area. There's a, a paper by Cyrus Omar and his collaborators from Popple 17 where they actually give the static semantics of a programming language that is not for which contains programs that aren't yet complete. So they've got you know holes in it and and types and you can represent a type error as putting a thing in a hole. All these sorts of things, and they've and then they went sort of full PL meta theory on the verbs of their of their editor, um, and you, know, you could look at how they evaluate things and the kinds of theorems they're proving. Um, also uh, the the hair project and the uh, the general uh, functional programming refactoring project from. The University of Kent, um, you know, they've got this final paper in JFP from 2013, and that's also definitely worth reading to see how that all worked. So another dream that I have is that when I change two letters of my Haskell file, the answer, the, the, the feedback will come back instantaneously. Whereas, you know, if I, and if I change a little bit more, the feedback comes back slightly less instantaneously. So in other words, the idea of incremental feedback from, uh, from a system is that you know, the time to give the user feedback should be a function of the size of their edits rather than the size of their program. And there's kind of two sub-problems here. One of them is incremental parsing with the layout rule and the sort of complexities of Haskell syntax. And the other one is uh, figuring out how to make the type checker incremental. So as far as how to do an incremental parser, that is largely a solved problem. I think that there's probably some room to make it a little bit more declarative, so you're not sort of doing lexer hacks all the time. But, um, but you know, it's it should be a matter of taking the declarative indentation specs that like Michael Adams has worked on and the um, some of the interesting like incremental parser generation work and and kind of put them together. But um, some places to look for info on this are TreeSitter, um, which is this wonderful library from uh, Max Brunsfeld. And on their webpage, they have this underlying research page, which describes a ton of stuff. Um, and then you should also read, uh, one of those things is uh, Tim Wagner's PhD thesis. I believe it's from 1997. And uh, it's missing some important bits. And those are documented in Lucas Diekman's PhD thesis, which was very recent. And so if you're interested, that's, that's a, a cool area to look at. Um, and also, there's a number of papers on making type checkers of various sorts incremental. And probably you can build on their work if you want to do that. I think for this one, like the evaluation is clear, right? Like, um, you know, how much work needs to be done for damage to a program of a certain extent. Um, and but another thing that, that, that the literature doesn't necessarily talk about, you know, Tim Wagner's thesis talks about this, but since then less um, is can we use the previous version of the program to help recover from errors? So uh, let's say I delete a closing parenthesis from my program. What should the parser, where should the parser complain? Like one answer is it should sort of go as far to the right as possible and say, that's where you're missing your parenthesis. That's a perfectly reasonable answer. Um, another thing it could say is, oh, it should go as far to the left as possible. That's where you're missing your parenthesis. But perhaps it should also say, you're missing a parenthesis from the very spot where you deleted it, taking your previously par well part or your previously well formed program into account when giving this feedback. Because usually, when I'm making uh, an edit to a program, I'm the the, the sort of subcomponents of the program that were meaningful before are still sort of intended to be meaningful by me. 
Um, and so that, that could be a very interesting and useful thing to look at. And likewise for a type checker, um, you know, if I, if, I, if I make some changes to the program, then probably the type error should be reported where I made the changes rather than in the place to which the constraint solver has flowed information about the changes. Um, and then also, wouldn't it be cool if like, I could open up a file and Simon could open, a, could open up the same file and we could sit there and like hack on it together and see each other's edits and essentially play like a type constraint pong by sending problems at each other? That would be so much fun. Uh, another dream is Haskell and debuggers. So, so today, there's, there's a long history of debuggers for Haskell. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's a, a long series of research where they tried to do various kinds of sort of new paradigms on debugging, you know, declarative debugging. And most of these systems were difficult in practice because they relied on sort of global program transformations that you don't want to do to your entire transitive dependency chain. And they often had unacceptable performance overheads. Um, and, and, and perhaps there would have been an issue with uh, adoption anyway because unfamiliar debugging paradigms or unfamiliar programming language gives people two difficult things to learn rather than just one. Um, but you know, eventually we end up with the GHCI debugger. Um, ra raise your hands if you've used the GHCI debugger in the last year. That's more than I thought, but still uh, a minority of attendees. Um, so I talked to a lot of Haskellers who have never used it. And why, why is that the case? That could be an interesting empirical study. You know, it, it does work. It's there. It's documented. Um, and yet, it, adoption is not as big as it perhaps could be. You know, like in my last job, I wrote a fair bit of Kotlin code. And there, we used the debugger all the time. And it was a, a fundamental tool for figuring out how things work and for, you know, like, you know, tests don't pass, run them in the debugger and, like, see what's going on. Um, and yet, this is not a common workflow in Haskell. Why not? That would be a really interesting thing to find out. So another, another way to, to think about debugging. Now I'm getting a little bit further from the nuts and bolts of things that are useful. So for those in the room who have never used a debugger, a debugger consists typically of three windows. You've got a window which shows the source code you're working in. You've got a window that shows the values of your local variables. And then you've got your stack. Um, and so you know, we, we come in, and we, we run the program, and we hit a breakpoint. And you know, we, in our breakpoint, we can kind of see where we're going, what's left to do. We can see the values of the variables. OK, so we, we step. And now we've you know, got a little bit more to do. And you know, we, we step. And now we are going to, and now we've, you know, we've saved that we've, we've, we've assigned a thunk to the expression on the right, on, in the argument position. And you know, we need to evaluate the function. We do that. You know, it's some, it's some built-in thing. OK. And, and the body of the function is now causing this to, is now causing the thunk to be forced, right? And on our, on our stack, we just have a little reminder that when we're done evaluating this thing, mute, go mutate that thunk. You know, we, and then we're going to do the same thing for name. And you know, I type in David, and it, it, we keep going. And then it's computed, hello, David. Store that in thunk x. And then uh, Prince Sterling could do it. So, so this, this is a debugger, but it, it also is a pretty good description of an abstract machine, right? So a typical abstract machine is a, a technique that we use to gain insight into some aspect of the operational behavior of a program. And you know, like the, the STG machine is, is certainly one uh, way we can do this. But other abstract machines allow us to see other things. And they all provide different lenses on the functioning of a program. So in some sense, like this is like the control register in a typical abstract machine. And this is like your environment, or your heap, or your store. And, and here's your stack. And so just like the, 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 the debugger in Dr. Racket is like very obviously a CEK machine, the debugger I've just shown you is uh, based on Sistoff's abstract machine here, which he's got this nice paper where it's derived from uh, sort of yeah, uh, operational semantics for lazy evaluation. So it'd be kind of interesting to see like what kinds of other abstract machines can help us see programs in new ways while we're running them. Um, yeah, and, and also like, are there ways that we can make debugging more easy, more easy to use in connection with our users? Um, so for example, like imperative, op lang imperative languages give you this like step over, step in, step out as the verbs in the debugger. Um, well, when I want a debugger, it's mostly when I'm writing some kind of sort of fairly imperative code. And as we all know, Haskell is an excellent imperative programming language. So what if, what if we had a step to the next bind command? And, um, and actually, uh, you know, like there's, there's some work in progress to implement this Microsoft uh, debugger protocol, which has implementations at least for VS Code and Emacs. And it would be interesting to see 
new debuggers that all work sort of in the way people expect. I don't even know what people expect. That, that, that's a cool problem to find out. Um, here, I think, can first year undergrads figure it out? That is a very, very useful question to ask because if our concern is that we have a debugger that no one's using, who better to talk about barriers to use than people who are not experts and who are not sort of uh, comfortable with just digging into the user manual and figuring out all the commands? Um, you know, also, if you're doing the abstract machine thing, you, know, you can certainly prove that the, um, that the semantics of the abstract machine are correct. Um, and also, like, it might be worth thinking a bit taking a step back, what does it mean to observe the value of something during evaluation of a program? Right? Like, like Haskell is one of those languages where in order, to view, in order to observe something, you have to change it. And does, what does that mean for the process of debugging? Like that, that's just an interesting thing to think about. Um, another question is, how do type class laws, how can they contribute to interactive programming? So today, we write down a definition of the functor class, but then we go into our haddock and we, we, we describe what a functor additionally has to do. Why don't we write it here in our source code and say, you know, the, law, the functor laws are the identity and the composition laws. Um, furthermore, like for other classes, we might want to write more laws. You know, for monad state, we might want to talk about the interaction of get and put. And then once the, once the computer knows about the laws, then we have refactoring possibilities, right? So I could right click in my program right here and apply the law get after put and transform it to a new program that's simpler. And I could also go the other way as like an intermediate step toward building something new. Similarly, if I'm implementing a, an instance of some class, well, probably I'm gonna want to test it. So why can't I right click, say generate tests, get a little pop-up which describes all of the relevant classes and then spits out some quick check properties for me. Um, you know, and, and I used Endo in particular because there's a, a paper that tells you how to do that. So don't tell me that we can't do uh, equality of functions here. Um, although, um, like how, how could we think about an evaluation? Like one thing is, can we actually use these laws to get things done? And the other, the other, the other thing that's, that's interesting is like, what does equal even mean there? Like there's, there's been a lot of discussion about that the last couple of days. And, you know, as, as a person who's spent, who's spent some time in the land of dependent types, like, I, I feel you, like equality is, is tough stuff. Um, and, but what should it mean when we, when we say that uh, like equality in a type class law? Like that, that's actually a, a sort of a, an interesting question to ask. Okay, another dream. We have this literature on program calculation. Can we support this with tooling? Right, so, so we, we've, we've all, many of us at least have seen this, uh, this example where you write uh, reverse and it, ha and it contains an append and that gives us uh, quadratic overhead. And, well, what if we say that we want to define reverse with this reverse prime, and then we say calculate definition, we write a specification in a box, and then our editor enters a new state. And in this new state, the specification is in scope. We, we can sort of continue the task or abort it. And now we can right click on X's and say case split. You can do that today, mostly. <laughs> um, but then we, it, it, it should refine our specification on the right-hand side along with the, the problem on the left. You know, and now we can maybe highlight this expression because we see an opportunity to make progress and we can right click on it and pick reduce. And then we can you know, highlight this because this is clearly something we can reduce. We can highlight it, right click, reduce. And this case is done. Then we can highlight this, you know, right click, reduce. And now the fact that we've implemented not only type class laws, but also sort of laws for ordinary programs that aren't part of type classes, means that our tool already knows that we have an associativity property here that we can just refine with. And then we can highlight again, and, and, and it notices that it matches our induction hypothesis, and now that becomes one of the verbs that is presented to us by our tool. Um, and so on and so forth. I'm not gonna go through the whole thing. Right, and so some ways we could evaluate a tool like this is we could say, well, like, let's do all the textbook examples of program calculation interactively. Uh, then let's do some advanced stuff. Let's calculate some compilers. And if that works out, well, then in, in order to make something that's relevant for, for practice, you know, a, a standalone web app or a standalone GUI app isn't going gonna, isn't gonna to cut it because you know, you'll, you'll write it up, you'll document it, and, and then it'll bit rot because very few people who are working on Haskell code on a daily basis are going to pop up a separate program 
to do a calculation task. But if we can you know, represent the state of the current refinement problem in magic comments in the source code or something like that, then we can use the verbs of LSP to actually implement the tool that we want. You might empirically study, you know, does this make your job easier as a teacher? Do undergrads have a lower, um, have a lower defect rate or do they learn things quicker? And then, and then finally, like, it, it'd be really great if this thing spat out uh, liquid Haskell proof that we could put in our CI system such that we you know, could maintain our proof over time as part of our system. Um, and, and, and sort of the earlier work, it's like Hira is, a term, is, a is, is an ancient program for equational reasoning in Haskell, sort of standalone. Um, I haven't been able to find it to actually run it and test it out. Um, and then there's also Hermit, of course, which is like a scripting language that does equational reasoning on GHC core. Another question, can we use informative types for other aspects of the programming process, right? So today we, we have this idea, like our types live inside of our language, but when it comes to talking with our customers or when it comes to writing our documentation, then we take our types and we drop kick them off to the curb and say, you're not welcome here anymore. So um, one thing we might wanna look into doing is, is seeing if we can write a, a new version of Haddock that's extensible as Haskell, and I don't say just say in Haskell, but as Haskell, right? So maybe we can write a Haskell library that contains the specification of like a nice little mini DSL for commutative diagrams, then just import that into our documentation and, and then use it as part of our docs and get a type error if we specify the commutative diagram wrong. That would be really cool. Um, and this, this is inspired by Scribble, which is a racket documentation tool, but I suspect that a Haskell version of it would in involve a lot of really interesting new things to figure out. Um, and this is, this is something that Don Syme tried to get me to work on years ago, and I, I still think it's a cool idea. Um, the idea is that um, we could also represent the support, the support expectations that we've provided our clients with explicitly as a kind of type system, or as a kind of meta type system, or something along those lines. So if I'm in my editor and I'm writing a payment processing system, I, I, I see this warning here, and I think, why is there a warning here? You know, I, I, I didn't do any variable shadowing. Um, and I put the mouse over it, and I get a little pop-up and it says, this API call is only supported until you know, February 15th next year. And so maybe, you know, and I can configure my tool and say like, start warning me six months before my stuff isn't supported anymore. And that'll give me a bit of time to start adapting. Uh, this, this could also, uh, you know, this is not only relevant for that, it's also relevant for maybe GHC releases, I'm not sure. Um, and then likewise, on the, on, the per, on the side of the person providing the API, well, Let's say, they, let's say they take this re reserve funds action and they say they want to add another argument, right? They want to add an access token. Um, well, now they get an error. And if they go look at what that error it says, it says this API call is supported until February 15th and you can't modify it today. It is a type error if you break your client's code in a time frame that you haven't promised. That'd be fun. So, you know, there's the usual questions about type systems here. Like, can we, what kinds of errors can we rule out with them? Um, how can we support interactive programming better? Um, but also, um, and also specifically with the documentation idea, like, you know, the one, one thing that's difficult with Haddock as it stands today is that it's, it's quite useful for writing API references and say, you know, this function does this, but it's a bit less, it doesn't really have a, a good sort of natural place to say, here are the concepts of this library that I'm describing. Like, what, what is a lens? You know, and, and we have various hacks for that. Like we can make a module that just contains the docs and, but it would be great if we had a way to organize things into a coherent document and not just have, not only have the generated things. And you know, can we can we scale up to that? Would be a, a useful advance. And then the final the final thing to think about is how should big teams build big applications in Haskell? You know, for for other styles of programming, there's a, a sort of copious literature on sort of techniques for working together, for making big systems. Uh, but, but a lot of that knowledge in, in the Haskell community is still quite tacit. You know, I, I think many of us have ideas about how to do that. Many of us have done it. And yet, I can't, you know, if a new team shows up who hasn't hired one of the people with that experience, but they'd like to try it with Haskell, I mean, first I'm gonna say like, you know, go hire an experienced person because it's always good to have experience. But, you know, having, having some, some written studies saying like, here's how successful teams actually build things in Haskell would be great, you know, and take that tacit implicit knowledge and make it something that's explicit and empirically studied. And this is something that I also think as a community, we maybe don't have 
the the background to evaluate very well or do very well on our own. So I'd encourage you to find software engineering researchers who've done more of this and, and collaborate if this is the thing you want to do. Um, and if and if you get a paper like this for the PC, like definitely it'd be great to have connections to some people we could pull in. Okay, so you know the the dreams that I that I that make me wake up smiling. Right, we have code editing actions, we have incremental GHC, we have a variety of interesting debuggers that people actually use. Uh, we have support for type class laws while we're editing. We have interactive program calculation. We have types for all the things and, and also well-studied software engineering principles. So if we do these things, you know, how do, we, how do we have an impact with them? How do we get them used? How do we make ideas that don't just make Haskell better, but also make the rest of the world better? Well, first off, we need to pay attention to what other communities value. Uh, I've seen rhetoric in Haskell community in the past, like uh, where people say, you know, look, look at, look at, look, you know, here's here's the design patterns book, you know, for for Java. Well, we don't need that because our language is better. I would say, well, actually, I agree that we don't need those specific to document those specific design patterns because our language is different. But the fact that another community values a thing should in, should not make us think we're better than them. It should make us think, what can we learn from them? And you know, things look, think, you know, Haskell is different from most other languages, but I suspect that the things that are useful for most people are going to be useful for us, suitably adapted. Um, likewise, um, other communities, to a higher extent than we do, um, value a coherent tooling experience. And I think that our high pain tolerance as a community means that we fail to attract some people with a lower pain tolerance. And, you know, the situation is absolutely getting better, it's not bad, but if we, want to, if we want to have a big impact, make a big splash on the world in the future, then we really need to be looking at other people's values and seeing what we can learn from them. Similarly, I don't think we should try to innovate on everything at once. Um, where we can, we should, be like, we should be like the rest of the world. For example, uh, we could sit down and say, we are going, you know, we are going to invent our own uh, new paradigm of programmer interaction and we're going to do it all in Haskell. We're going to make our Haskell GUI library. We're going to make our, you know, we're going to link in GHC and we're going to do it with this like fancy. Don't do that. Like find the smallest thing you can innovate on and innovate there and in, and in all other respects, adopt what the rest of the world uses because that'll give them a bigger on-ramp into what we're doing and thus spread the good things. Finally, um, we need to build real tools that people can use um, and not just little demos. GHC has gotten so much better because it has users. And because it has, and because it gets better, it can get more users, right? We get this virtual cycle, this virtuous cycle. And you know, it, building a little demo is great, but building a real, a real usable tool like GHC or like Liquid Haskell means that there's a real chance that if people that people will get value out of it, and they'll help maintain it over time, and maybe they'll even start companies that pay to help maintain it over time. And and we need to think about usability. Um, you know, maybe not in the start, but in the long run. So. We've talked a bit about how to have impact, but then also, you know, how do we evaluate and publish? Like, making a sweet demo is cool, but you can't write a paper that says, "Hey, look, this is awesome!" Right? You need you need to find ways to think about it using the tools of the and the values of the programming language community. This is where I think the the Hazel team is doing a wonderful job, and we can also look at you know building tools on more rigorous foundations. So, um, so for example, uh, Rotor, the Rotor team, which is making a, a Refactoring tools for OCaml. They had this uh, this paper at PLDI 19 where they're sort of talking about renaming and and making a rename refactor and justifying it in terms of the semantics of OCaml. That's really cool. We need to see more of that. Okay, thank you for entertaining me while I talk about my dreams. Now it's time to talk about my waking life. Um, what is the Haskell Foundation? We are, uh, we, are, we are a fairly young nonprofit organization, and we really want to get make Haskell usable by more people, which increases the impact of all of your research. And we want to do this by you know, supporting the tools, supporting our libraries, um, you know, Haskell in education where relevant, and also in research. You know, Haskell is all of these things, and they all need support. And the, the main way we're trying to do this is to not come in and say, you know, now we're going to do all the things, but rather to look for ways that we can support existing community processes, whether they be in academia or in open source or in um, corporate development, and just try to try to find sort of missing spots and opportunities to coordinate things 
rather than sort of reinventing the wheel. You know, we're not here to seize power and tell you what to do. We're here to find ways that we can help you do what you're already doing. I am lucky to have a, a big board of directors. Some of them are sitting in this room. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, you know, that's, I, I'm really blessed to have these people to talk to on a regular basis. They, they're super helpful. And if you're interested in what the foundation's up to, you can talk to them as well as to me. Um, I am the executive team. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've, I've, been, I've been with the foundation since May of 2022. In the past, I've used Haskell and Industry at Galois and at Dion Digital. Um, I have a PhD from IT University of Copenhagen back in 2015. So I do know a little bit about programming languages, so you can talk to me about those. Um, I also used to work on the Idris 1 compiler, which was also a big Haskell project. Um, one of our biggest projects, the, the thing we're spending the most resources on right now, is uh, having Brian Richter, uh, who you may know as TreeCat from IRC, uh, doing DevOps services for GHC. So he's trying to make the CI work more reliably and faster and make all of that work. Um, he's also used Haskell a fair bit industry in the past. Um, another of our projects, which I'll have a demo for later today, is this Haskell error index. So as of, I believe, two and a half days ago, uh, when, if you're using the, the latest uh, master of GHC and you get, a, you get a type error or a warning, it's got a little unique code. And then um, very soon now, you'll be able to type this code into this website and get some documentation, right? So we can see like, you know, so if you're a user out there and you get kind variable would escape its scope, you know, GHC dash four, six, nine, five, six, you can go and type that in and you can get uh, a written documentation. You can get examples of programs that exhibit the error, examples where the error has been fixed, and all these things. Um, this is inspired by the Rust error index. And if, if any of you are working on Haskell tools that are not GHC, this is intentionally designed to also admit other tools. So the Haskell Foundation is administering the namespace of error codes. And if you are working on, say, Cabal or Stack or HLS or um, happy or anything that, 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 has, that has an error message that might confuse people, please feel free to, to join this system and we can get them all together because people don't always know which tool is producing the error. Um, and there'll be a demo later today of how to add documentation to this index. Um, another project that's in the works is a security advisory database. This is based on the ones used in Rust and NPM. And we, so the idea is that if, let's say you've got a, You've got a library and you discover that it could be vulnerable in certain cases to certain kinds of attacks. We're gonna have a centralized database where you can go inform the community about that and about mitigations, about the attack, about the attack surface. And then this, these uh, notifications are machine readable and they can serve as a data source both for build tools like Cabal and Stack, but also for third party tools like Dependabot on GitHub. And ideally, this is going to not only be a useful thing for individuals sitting there working on their programs, but also for organizations who need to get various ISO certifications that require things like automated vulnerability scanning. And this opens up Haskell for use in these circumstances, or at least makes it easier to pass the audit. Uh, we have the Haskell Interlude podcast, which has regular interviews with members of the Haskell community. I've enjoyed listening to it. And uh, they've asked me to inform you that they're looking for a new co-host and for guests. So please get in touch with them if you, if you like talking. Uh, uh, Jeffrey Young is organizing a Haskell optimization handbook. So if you don't know how to make Haskell code go fast and you'd like to learn, hopefully we'll have a great resource for that soon. Um, uh, we're also looking at supporting various processes in the community. So for example, the hackage security process requires um, regular uh, re-signing of various aspects. And you know we're not taking over the root keys, but we are taking over the responsibility of emailing the people with the root keys and saying, won't you please sign this? Um, and having it and make sure it happens on time because you know that's that's the kind of thing that's ideally done by by someone who's whose job it is. And also soon I'm going to be doing a lottery factor audit, which and the lottery factor of a project is the number of people who have to win the lottery and retire to a tropical paradise and never write code again before the project falls apart and fails. Um, and I'll, so I'll be doing that for key community infrastructure. Uh, we have some working groups uh, that get together and figure things out. Two of them that are most relevant to this room are the technical working group, which is responsible for keeping our technical agenda sort of anchored in the needs of the community, both research and open source and uh, corporate. And you know we've, 
we evaluate project proposals and figure out like how should we spend our resources as a foundation. And there's a stability working group, which is trying to find ways to make uh, Haskell updates easier in particular. Like how do we make your code bit route more slowly? Um, our sponsors include a number of generous members of the Haskell community, thank you. And also a number of companies who support us on a regular basis. I can't do my work without them, thank you. Um, and now is the time where in a normal talk somebody would ask for questions, but I'm gonna ask you questions and I hope that you'll give me some answers. Um, but also, of course, feel free to ask me questions. So the, the first question is, how can the Haskell Foundation facilitate progress on research? Um, you know, are there things we can do that'll help you do your jobs better? Uh, also, how can we assist in tech transfer? I see, I see two issues with tech transfer today in Haskell. One of them is that uh, we make cool things and, and not enough people use them. But the other is that we make, we, we make some, someone might write a paper, present it at the Haskell Symposium, and, and then somebody who doesn't have experience evaluating the status of research might say, there's a paper about this, thus it is good, thus I must use it. And then they, they go to work and they rewrite their code base using um, whatever fancy feature it is. And, and it turns out that it wasn't well suited to the problem. So if we can find ways to help explain to people like, oh, you know, this thing, this thing is solid. You should definitely use it. Um, or at least we think it is, you know, use it and tell us what goes wrong versus, you know, this thing is a really interesting first step in a research program. And I don't know that we're always good at communicating that to practitioners. So if there's a way the Haskell Foundation can help do that, that would be really great. And then also, likewise, if, we, if you can think of ways that we can help turn problems faced by practitioners, by industrial users of Haskell, into new research questions and, and, get, the, and get that feedback loop going, please let me know. Um, and with that, I want to turn it over to you, my, my questioners. Oh. <laughs>